Okay, uh, so for today, we'll take a look at a couple more passages uh, from the Wall Street Journal, right, that we'll be taking a look at. And so we'll have the recordings once again to help us go through some of the important articles from the book, right, that we'll be taking a look at for today. Uh, so um, <clears throat> the first article that we're about to take a look at would be how being more productive starts with doing nothing. And so we'll read through the article. Uh, with the uh, narration, right, that will be provided here as well. So, the recording will be. How being more productive starts with doing nothing. It's gotten harder to create mental breaks as work and home have blurred. Here are ways to get your brain a rest. One secret to achieving more, finding time to do nothing. In our efforts to squeeze every second from the day, it seems counterintuitive to watch a pot of coffee boil or gaze out the window. But your brain uses those free periods for important cleanup work, neuroscience research indicates. And during the pandemic, as the boundaries between work and home have blurred, it has become harder to create mental breaks. Even brief timeouts help the brain reinforce long-term learning and productivity. You come out of downtime able to learn more and can access that learning faster. When you take a break, you may want to do something mind-consuming to help with motivation, but technically your best way of taking a break is to do something mindless says Barbara Oakley, a professor of engineering at Oakland University in Michigan, who teaches a popular online course on how to open your mind to learning. To ease into allowing yourself to do nothing, start with something familiar. Here are some techniques. Take a long shower. A natural place to start slowing down is a habit that's already built into your schedule, such as taking a shower. Letting your mind wander here can be a stepping stone to quieting more hectic environments. Or try blocking off time to look out your window. In her book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, writer Jenny O'Dell describes how bird watching became her favorite slowdown activity. Exhausted after pulling an all-nighter, she had gazed out the window and noticed a cluster of yellow birds. I burned out, and in that state of forced relaxation, that happened to be when I noticed, she says. Play a game without keeping score. Dr. Oakley points out that while our body's dopamine reward system might encourage tasks, keeping score is labor. Instead of competing against your crossword best, find a puzzle game on your phone that requires simply swiping. Take a solo walk. Leave the Fitbit at home and free up an hour to absorb the scenery in silence. Being in nature has been linked to a multitude of physical and mental benefits, but be sure not to create a competition, which can take the relaxation out of the activity. We get fixated on taking 10,000 steps, Miss O'Dell says. Yes, it's good to go for a walk, but this isn't a job. Enjoy the meandering rather than the race, she suggests. Cook a big meal. Borrowing from the downtime that the Italians call dolce far diente, the sweetness of doing nothing, the act of cooking a meal can encourage a wandering mind. It can be tempting to create a culinary masterpiece to make the time worth it, but fight the urge. Miss O'Dell suggests trying to see the non-work time as something other than the negative space left after work. Try a simple recipe that requires slow preparation. Not only is the activity downtime, but bonus points for resting at the table between courses. Just sit down. If you're struggling to get enough rest at night, try a short nap. Simply find a comfortable chair and breathe. While you're napping, remember that your brain never is. Rest is one of the most important ways to enhance the neurological flexibility to build the kind of conceptual understanding that is related to identity and purpose, says Mary Helen Imordino Yang, a professor of education, psychology, and neuroscience at the University of Southern California. 
consider that a reason to lose the guilt over a daily rest. Okay, uh, so these are uh, some of the ways, right? You could be uh, How finding being rest. More productive right? uh, starts with the doing day. nothing. Okay, so let's go over uh, trying to do nothing. Uh, so let's go over the next uh, article that we have, right? Tech companies say they can't find good employees. The companies may be the problem, right? So tech companies, uh, they can't find good employees, maybe the problem. So let's take a look at this passage, right? That we have. Okay. Tech companies say they can't find good employees. The companies may be the problem. The hiring process could be weeding out able workers, especially women and minorities. Many technology companies bemoan how difficult it is to find good employees. A new study suggests the companies themselves might be partly to blame. At issue is a widespread reliance on what is known as the technical interview process. In addition to the usual vetting of credentials seen in many industries, technical interviews typically subject job candidates to layers of intense testing. Generally, such tests evaluate critical thinking and problem-solving skills. They can include brain teasers and complicated technical problems unrelated to actual on-the-job roles and responsibilities. The trouble is this. Candidates often get so flustered from the pressure and the mechanics of the interview that their performance is significantly hindered. Companies that rely on these stressful tests are eliminating potentially qualified candidates to their own detriment, says Christopher Parnan, assistant professor of computer science at North Carolina State University and senior author of the study, which was published in November. This is particularly unfortunate, Dr. Parnan says, given the availability of other, less stressful, and perhaps more appropriate testing metrics. Relying on technical interviews can also have a disproportionate impact on minorities and other underrepresented groups and discourage job seekers from applying, Dr. Parnan says, noting that even senior level employees can be afraid to transfer within their own organizations for fear of failing such tests. Dr. Parnan and his fellow researchers designed an experiment in which 48 computer science students were given a problem to solve, one used within the past several months in technical interviews at well-known software companies. Nearly half, 22 of the individuals, were tasked with solving a technical problem in private on a whiteboard. The other students went through the typical interview format in which they were asked to solve the problem out loud with a proctor present. An experimenter was situated nearby but did not interrupt the participant's thought process. If a participant asked for clarification, the response was brief. Participants in both settings wore specialized eye-tracking glasses so researchers could take measurements associated with high cognitive load and stress and compare the data. The disparities in test results achieved by the two groups were telling. About a third of the participants who were watched solved the problem correctly, compared with about two-thirds of those without proctors. Participants with proctors present reported feeling nervous, rushed, stressed, and unable to concentrate. Participants without proctors reported feeling more at ease and appreciated being given time on their own to understand the problem and reflect on their solution. Analysis of the eye tracking data supported those feelings. Participants who were asked to problem solve in a public setting had slower eye movements, a marker for high stress. Here's another interesting takeaway for a male dominated industry that is increasing efforts to attract more women. Researchers observed that among women with a proctor present, no one successfully solved the problem, whereas all of the women working alone solved the problem. While the study is based on limited data, Dr. Parnan says the results should, at the very least, lead to further research in this area. Additionally, he says, tech companies should consider alternative testing methods for potential new hires and for employees looking to advance to more senior level jobs. 
A shift to testing problem-solving skills in a private setting, for example, could relieve some pressure and allow for more accurate assessment, he says. Such a shift could substantially increase the number of qualified candidates, particularly in traditionally underrepresented groups entering the workforce, he says. Companies could also drop problem-solving tests as currently offered and instead ask candidates to spend five minutes explaining how they would perform a particular job-related task, Dr. Parnon says. Focusing on communication skills in this way, Dr. Parnon says, can reveal how a candidate thinks. Okay, uh, so once again, there's disparities between the two groups, right? Tech uh, companies say they can't find good employees. The employees and the employers, right? And they're uh, despairing. Uh, parenting view of uh, uh, the other party, right? They might be able to find here uh, in this article, right, that we have. Uh, so the next passage, the next passage uh, that we have would be the business travel was terrible and I miss it so much, right? And so we'll be going over uh, the next uh, sort of passage on business, right, that we'll be taking a look at for today. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, the passage will read. Business travel was terrible, and I miss it so much. A newfound appreciation for long waits at airports, bland rental cars, and rooms without views. I keep hearing business travel may never return to pre-pandemic levels. Bill Gates suspects 50% of it will disappear, and it makes me sad. I should be grateful to have a job of any kind, and I am, but I miss those work escapes. If I'm being honest, my family misses my business travel more than I do. My family has been saying polite things about how being stuck at home in 2020 has made us all closer, but I think they've had enough. They'd really prefer me out of the house. If I ever leave again, they're going to celebrate like they won the Super Bowl. I'll be back in two days, I'll say. Take 20, my family will say. I miss little things about work travel, like packing. I'd fold my clothing into a bag and I'd think, I should bring my running shoes. Then I'd think, who are you kidding? You're never going to go running. Then. No, no, I really am going to go running. So I'd always pack the running shoes and I'd never go running. I miss getting to the airport early. I got this habit from my father, the ultimate panicky early bird. My father wanted to get to the airport when the architect was still presenting the blueprints to build the airport. He liked to be the first person through the door when the pilots were hitting the snooze button at the Hyatt. Even then, my father worried he was cutting it close. I don't miss everything. I don't miss the line for the only airport Starbucks. You could show up at 4.45 a.m. and there would be 80 people online. And I'd always get stuck behind someone buying mochaccinos for an entire high school orchestra. I admit, I kind of miss the guy doing a long, loud conference call that everyone can hear. You know this guy. He's pacing and gesturing at gate 35D bellowing away like he's doing Shakespeare in the park. He's got thoughts about the meeting. He's got thoughts about the client. He'll yammer away, straight through boarding, down the walkway, and right until takeoff, when the flight attendants beg him to hang up. I always think the other people on his call are thinking, I can't wait for this guy to shut up. I miss the pilot calmly talking about where we are online for departure. I miss the boring testimonial for the airline featuring the airline CEO. I'm already on the plane, I think. I miss sitting next to a traveler who opens up a laptop and starts reading a big, complicated report with lots of graphs. I'm always impressed. Wow, this person is really committed to their job. Then, 40 seconds later, they switch to a Bruce Willis movie. I miss LaGuardia Airport. Okay, that's a lie. I don't miss LaGuardia Airport. 
I miss getting to my hotel room and dramatically opening the curtain to a view of pigeons playing poker in an abandoned parking garage. I miss the hour it takes me to figure out how to turn on the hotel TV. I miss the hotel water, which I drink, only to later discover a tiny sign telling me it costs $11 a bottle. I miss the rental cars, which were always dull. I miss the rental car agent trying to talk me into a PT cruiser for an extra $7 a day. Come on, do it. Live a little, man. I miss almost all of it. I have a feeling we're going to get at least partly back there, not just because of the hopeful news about vaccines, but because we probably need face-to-face -face contact a little more than we think. I don't think work travel will ever vanish, mostly because our families want us out of the house. Okay, uh, so a little bit of uh, business travel right, that we would have read about. Business travel was terrible, and I miss it so much. A newfound appreciation for long waits at airports. It's uh, idiosyncrasies and uh, some of the interesting sort of elements uh, that we would have been able to take a look. Uh, the next uh, article that we have with the office app makers kept cashing in on uh, pandemic safety needs, right? Uh, they talked about like being in hotel, right? And all uh, uh, the uh, sort of uh, relevant amenities, right? Uh, also the airport, right? Would have to mention. Okay, uh, so the next article that we have with the office at Makers uh, clashing in on pandemic safety needs, right? So we'll take a look at that uh, and go through some of the important sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, passages, right? That uh, will be involved, right? And so let's take a look at the next article. Office app makers cashing in on pandemic safety needs. Real estate firm VTS is buying startup Rise Buildings in $100 million deal. Investors are pouring money into phone apps that enable companies to monitor employees' movements and ensure they are complying with social distancing and other COVID-19 related health protocols. Employers can tell from a glance at the screen whether a conference room has exceeded the number of employees who can safely meet or whether too many people are on one floor. Workers can also use these apps to take precautions like checking how many colleagues are using the gym or how recently the cafeteria was sanitized. While apps with similar features have been available for years for office security or convenience purposes, landlords and big corporate tenants are giving these tools a fresh look during the pandemic. This is especially true as the recent rollout of vaccines in the U.S. raises the prospect that millions of workers could return to their office this year. In one of the biggest investments in this sector, real estate software and data firm VTS is acquiring Rise Buildings, a Chicago-based startup that developed a mobile app already used in over 130 million square feet of office space. VTS, which provides online tools for managing leases to landlords, is paying about $100 million, according to people familiar with the matter. In the return to work, every owner has to make sure their tenants know what's going on, said Nick Romito, VTS chief executive. Other mobile office app firms, which are part of the expanding prop tech business, are also experiencing growing demand from landlords and interest from investors. Lane, which launched in 2014, closed its first venture capital funding round in May, raising $10 million. The Toronto-based firm is used in more than 300 buildings in eight countries. It expects to announce another round in the next few months, according to co-founder and chief product officer Kofi Gaiki. Big landlords like Brookfield Office Properties, Oxford Properties, and Tishman Studio have signed up with Lane this year, Mr. Gaiki said. 
some office workers are bound to be uneasy with additional corporate scrutiny of their movements through these apps, and some employee advocates have already raised this issue. RISE Chief Executive Prasun Kale said privacy is a top priority and that the firm collects and aggregates data in a way that individuals are anonymous, he said. Employees can also opt out. You can never download the app if you don't want to, Mr. Kale said. RISE says most workers opt in because they recognize the health benefits, such as enabling workers to alert building staff about arriving visitors. If too many are arriving at any given time, passes won't be granted. Or if workers see unsafe conditions, apps provide a quick way for them to alert building management. Launched in 2018, RISE added 150 buildings to its client roster during the pandemic for a total of 350 properties, Mr. Kale said. Before the pandemic, mobile office app firms marketed their products to landlords as an amenity for tenants and their employees. They were used for a range of services, from booking conference rooms to ordering coffee or finding lunch companions. We began researching the category about one year and one half ago, Mr. Romito said. When COVID-19 hit, VTS stood back to see if the category was going to die really quickly or whether the pandemic would shine a massive light on landlords' need for tools that communicate directly with all their tenants and employees. Landlords say they are hoping office apps will give them critical data on how much their tenants are using their buildings. This will help them identify which ones are expanding or might be in danger of leaving, landlords say. In a post-COVID or living with COVID world, they're going to have to up their game, said Charles Garbarino, chief executive of HQO, an office app firm that raised a $34 million funding round in 2019. Okay, so once again, uh, the, the app makers, right, uh, on the different Office apps app uh, that we use. Office cashing right, in on pandemic safety needs. Okay, so uh, the next Real article. estate firm VTS is buying startup Rise Buildings in $100 million deal. The next article that we're about to take a look Beyond the cluttering tips, right? That we'll take a look. It is time to shed. Readers share decluttering tips. Readers eager to tidy up at home offer stories and advice for getting rid of household clutter. In response to a Wall Street Journal article about conquering the emotional minefields that come with tidying up, readers sent their own thoughts and tips for how to deal with clutter. The word I chose for 2021 was shed. Slimming down with projects, shedding my expectations, shedding extra stuff piled around the house and on my work desk and shedding pounds with exercising more. I really identified with the idea of more had to go out than in. Yes. Also, I loved identifying sensitive areas or items. Our shelter in place order is still outstanding here. 2020 was a year of panic and planning on the verge of hoarding. Supplies and food stocked up. We geared up for the unknown. Yet, here we are in 2021, and the clutter has multiplied with closets bursting. The freezer is packed for an apocalypse. Can we relax? It is time to breathe a sigh of relief. Yes, we are not through the pandemic yet. However, we are okay. We have enough. Eat the food in the freezer. It is time to shed. Madeline Ripkin Colber, Lodi, California. I have many antiques inherited from my parents and grandparents. I have begun taking pictures of them before sending them to an antiques dealer. I keep the picture with notes about the item so it is not completely gone. If someone comes into my home and says, I love that painting, I ask that person if he or she would like to have it. If yes, I have gifted it away. Dolly Prenzel, Nashville, Tennessee. I have a better solution. Plan on moving after a long time in one place. We recently decided to sell our home 
And the first thing we did was either to donate stuff or throw it out. We are even planning on changing out most of our 16 year old home. Every time I see someone that has a lot of clutter, it is a case they have been in that home a very long time. We also are refraining on making new purchases until we examine what we have existing in our home. Brett Sorge, West Palm Beach, Florida. I have done this many times for myself and family. Plus, as a designer, I plan homes in mind for things that matter. As you age continually, think about the last place you might want to live that is less than half the place where you currently reside. Begin ridding your environment of the unwanted. It's easier to have done over time. It affords you to also find a good home for the loved possessions rather than dumping and running at the end. You don't want to sit there with all of your mental faculties in a physically depleted body as your beloved possessions are being packed and sold by people who don't have the time to dispose of all to your wishes. Lorraine Durkin, Pittston, Pennsylvania. For things that were sentimental, usually items from my parents that I couldn't bring myself to give away, donate, or dispose of, I buried them in my backyard. I have not done this often, but it was helpful for a few things. The act became a ceremony. Andrew Bleak, Atlanta. My wife is an expert at decluttering, so I read this article with interest. I often say to my mother, but mom, the truth is you don't really need that. Referring to another ball of yarn that she will need at some indeterminate time in the future. She usually responds to my admonition with a quote from Act Two of King Lear. Oh, reason, not the need. My mother's view contrasts with my wife's propensity for decluttering our house. A friend once remarked, if you stand still long enough in his house, his wife will throw you out too. Lex Suvanto, New York. Okay, uh, so once again, uh, it is time to shed. Passes about uh, decl decluttering, right? Uh, things at home, right? That we would have been able to take a look. So let's take a look at the next article. Smart Device Push brings IT and R&D teams together. Colgate Palmolive and Procter & Gamble pair IT and R&D staffers to work on new products. Consumer packaged goods companies, in a push to develop more connected devices, are deploying their information technology talent, experts in machine learning and app building, to work alongside research and development groups to design and build new products. In this world of the Internet of Things, where we've got software embedded, it is somewhat of a no-brainer that we need to combine those skills all together, said Mike Crow, Chief Information Officer at Colgate Palmolive Co. Recent products include a smart toothbrush introduced last year that is designed to make recommendations on how a person could brush better. Colgate R&D staffers worked on the brush head, sensors, and other aspects of the physical product while members of the IT team develop the underlying application, including the machine learning that analyzes the data to make recommendations. It is really about maximizing the use of the combined skills, said Mr. Crow. Although IT and R&D have worked closely in electronics and manufacturing, which have strong engineering traditions, it is a relatively recent occurrence in other industries, said Eric Roth a senior partner at McKinsey & Co., and the leader of the firm's innovation and growth practice. The increased adoption of the Internet of Things, where sensors transmitting data in real time are embedded in various devices, as well as artificial intelligence to analyze that data, has extended its reach. So too has the expectation among more companies for IT to deliver more value. Within the consumer goods industry, some 70% of CIOs reported an increase in business leaders asking their departments to work on higher value, more strategic projects as a result of the pandemic, according to a 2021 Gartner CIO Agenda survey. 
Those projects include adding digital experiences to physical products, said Michelle Durst, Vice President, Analyst at Gartner. The IT function as a separate entity, operating as a service or a central center of competence alone, doesn't work, said Procter & Gamble Co. CIO Vittorio Cretella. Like Colgate, the consumer packaged goods company also has its IT and R&D teams working together, creating its own smart toothbrush, as well as the Olay Skin Advisor Personalized Skin Care Analyzer and the Gillette Style Advisor Facial Hair Style Assistant. Our partnership is now getting very, very pervasive in everything we do, said Victor Aguilar, P&G's Chief Research, Development, and Innovation Officer. How P&G and Colgate bring IT and R&D teams together is somewhat flexible and can vary depending on the project. The IT side often provides the software engineers who can build platforms and applications, data scientists with expertise in artificial intelligence, and Internet of Things specialists with connectivity skills. The R&D department, which may also have data scientists, will enlist clinical researchers who can advise the team on the usefulness and safety of a device, as well as industrial designers and product developers who can plan and build a first basic model of the product. The teams work together on initial research and create prototypes to prove the concept has legs, the company's executive said. But teaming up IT and R&D isn't without its challenges, McKinsey's Mr. Roth said. It's not a natural pairing, Mr. Roth said, adding that the two units are staffed by people coming from different cultures. For instance, IT traditionally runs and maintains equipment, while R&D's role has been to deliver research and products, he said. To help the two teams break down barriers and build trust, Colgate says it uses agile management, a common software development methodology in which participants break development into small tasks, develop various functions and features in short sprints, and quickly adjust if something isn't working or if a better idea surfaces. As IT and R&D departments work more closely together, they can learn from each other and get a better appreciation for the types of innovative products their companies might want to develop, said Mr. Roth. The teams could gain, he said, a much greater appreciation and role in thinking about their work being directly tied to value creation, he said. Okay, so IT and R&D, right, and the smart uh, devices, right? Smart uh, device push that brings the IT and R&D teams what together. I've talked about. Colgate pop. Okay, so the next article would be about uh, Alexa, right? Uh, that we'll be exploring on this article, right? That we have. So let's take a look. If Alexa won't talk to me, what hope is there? I crossed a line with my grumpy responses to her, and now I'm getting the silent treatment. People regularly complain that their electronic personal assistant Alexa is too chatty, that she unexpectedly mouths off about the weather or an exciting new television program or what time the sun will go down. Or she might suggest things the user should think about buying. But I have exactly the opposite problem. Alexa barely talks to me at all. On my Amazon Echo device, Alexa never alerts me that my favorite team is playing that night. She never reminds me about upcoming birthdays. She never tells me when the tide will be at its highest in the Hudson, much less the Atlantic. Basically, I don't think that Alexa likes me. This may be because of a tiff we had a few months ago when I told Alexa to never, ever play smooth jazz in my presence. Never. The problem, and I am willing to concede that Alexa might be right about this, is that it's hard for an electronic assistant to determine what constitutes smooth jazz when you issue a generic command. Alexa, play jazz. Alexa doesn't know that traditional jazz, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, Louis Armstrong, is divine, 
while smooth jazz, a surprisingly tenacious satanic leftover from the 1990s, is what you listen to when you are on hold for a dental appointment. And in these cases, I suspect that I may have taken on an abusive tone, questioning Alexa's intelligence and sophistication. And yes, perhaps even swearing at her, which was just not right, even though Alexa was clearly in the wrong. The same thing happened on several occasions when I wanted to talk to my son. When I said, Alexa, call Gordon Queenan. And she responded, did you mean Gordon Queenan? I simply lost it. Well, of course I meant Gordon Queenan, I exclaimed. How many times are you going to ask me the same stupid question, you inanimate pinhead? This was not a nice thing to say. Yes, true. My device may be inanimate in the narrow technical sense of the term, but Alexa probably knows that I would never have taken that tone with my phone, my laptop, my refrigerator, or my car, which is always acting up. And I would never have dared to raise my voice to my electric razor. That way lies madness. In Alexa's defense, I do have a strong Philly accent, which may be hard for any electronic unit to decipher though friends assure me that it has no trouble understanding denizens of the Bronx. Thus, when I saw a whole series of articles about people trying to get Alexa to shut up, I felt kind of weird. Amazon already has settings allowing users to make Alexa clam up. I don't need them. Since we had that last dust up, Alexa speaks only when spoken to, and then only grudgingly. I would love it if straight out of the blue, Alexa told me that a storm warning would go into effect at seven this evening. I would love it if Alexa told me that Weezer has a new record. I would love it if Alexa reminded me that St. Paddy's Day was just around the corner. But Alexa won't speak to me, except when I speak to her, which is really upsetting. It gets lonely here stuck in this big house all by myself for long stretches of the day. I would welcome the occasional unsolicited comment from my electronic personal assistant. But ever since I took a nasty tone with her, Alexa has gone mute. The other day, I tried to patch things up with Alexa by saying, Alexa, I'm sorry for being rude to you. That's all right, she answered, before adding something extraneous about accessing new notifications on my screen. Then I added, no, Alexa, I'm really sorry. Alexa said nothing, absolutely nothing. It's going to take a long time to rebuild this relationship. Okay, uh, so once again, uh, Alexa, right? Uh, an interesting, if Alexa won't uh, talk to of, me, uh, what hope is there? between the two that we would have heard about? I crossed a line with my grumpy response. Okay, so uh, the next article would be why uh, hourly wages can make you unhappy. And so we'll take a look at the article, right? With the next uh, 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 recording, right? That we have. Let's get started. Why hourly wages can make you unhappy. Putting a dollar value on your time means you tend to do more networking and less of what you really enjoy. People who get paid by the hour see their time differently than people who get a salary. And that has implications for both the way companies pay their employees and how people could increase their well being by altering the way they view their income. For over a decade, I've studied how people behave under different salary structures. My key findings, thinking about pay in hourly increments makes people focus more closely about the value of each hour and how they are spending it. That in turn has two primary behavioral changes. First, they are more willing to rack up extra hours on the job to bring in more cash. And second, they are more willing to spend time outside of work socializing with coworkers something that many people view as a time sink and makes them unhappy because the prospect of networking might help boost their career. 
These behaviors will only grow in importance as the gig economy booms and more companies shift jobs to outside contractors. These workers will view their pay less as a monthly or annual payout and more in terms of hours. A matter of hours. In my first studies on hourly work, which I conducted with Stanford University's Jeffrey Pfeiffer, we asked hourly workers if they would be willing to trade their free time for more work time to boost earnings. Most answered yes. Recently, Dr. Pfeiffer, UCLA PhD candidate Jiyun Pai and I studied data in the Bureau of Labor Statistics American Time Use Survey from 2003 to 2017. Our finding? People paid an hourly rate are more likely to hang out with colleagues outside of work and thereby get the chance to boost their pay down the road, and the willingness to schmooze increased among those earning a high income. We also conducted an experiment with more than 1,500 U.S. workers that asked them to imagine they could change their schedules to spend less or more time hanging out with coworkers, family, or friends. The hourly workers reported a greater desire to put in more hours with coworkers. Moreover, when we singled out a subset of high-income salaried workers and asked them to convert their salary into an hourly wage, they chose to spend more time with coworkers in similar numbers to high-income hourly workers. Having a clear monetary metric for time made networking seem like a better use of their time. The costs of networking. But just because people said they would change the way they use time if they could doesn't mean that it would bring them the most happiness. In the same experiment, we asked the participants whether they would view spending time with colleagues as fun. Among those motivated to spend more time with coworkers, our analysis found that it was done for professional gain. And a growing trove of research suggests trading time for money reduces happiness. It also can make us less likely to pursue other uses for our time that can increase happiness, but don't produce income like volunteering. What does all this mean for companies and employees? First, it is crucial for companies to consider how they present pay to workers because it can have effects neither of them are aware of. For instance, companies may be fostering more out of office socializing by presenting pay as an hourly wage. They may also be driving employees to work more, neither of which may be healthy, although it may be in the company's short-term interest. Meanwhile, workers should realize that seeing an hour of their time is worth, say, $50, comes at a cost if it goads them to socialize in ways that make them unhappy. After all, one of the reasons we work is so that we're able to enjoy time off the clock it may be worth reconsidering the value of time in terms of the happiness it brings. Okay, uh, so once again, uh, cost of uh, networking. Why hourly wage? Also, uh, the uh, right, uh, the pay uh, can make you unhappy. So what they would uh, spend their uh, sort of um, time and uh, sort of uh, money on, right? And networking was one of the uh, primary sort of uh, factors that the article would have uh, examined, right? So the next article that we have would be as a window opens, a plea for patience and grace, right? Uh, anniversary, right? With the road ahead. And so let's take a look at this uh, passage, right? That will be provided. Okay. As a window opens, a plea for patience and grace. A sobering anniversary coincides with guarded optimism about the road ahead. This column is for people like me who didn't write the great American novel during these past 12 months, or even 10 pages of a mediocre one, or attempt to build a castle from popsicle sticks, or bother to teach the dog a word of conversational French. I'm assuming this is almost all of us, because those sorts of achievements are hard to pull off in any year, 
and this past year has been stressful and scattered. And on most days, it's felt like a sizable human accomplishment to pull on slacks and plod to the grocery store. We're lumbering toward the wind down. At least that's the hope. We aren't close to out of it, but we appear to be improving. The vaccines are out there and the news about infection and hospitalization rates are good. Maybe not as good as the epidemiologists would like and certainly not good enough to burn the face masks and stroll into a crowded mall slapping high fives with strangers. Still, it's enough to produce a twinge of optimism. The slightest hint of confidence feels like a sunbeam, and I'm grateful to every person who's out there working hard to get the rest of us all back on track. There's human magic everywhere. Honestly, I found these past couple of months the hardest, and I don't think I am alone. December, January, and February felt like a slow march through sludge. I lost a friend too young, and then a close family member got sick. In both cases, not COVID, but cancer. And now we've lost her too. The winter was colder and drearier than expected, and the kids were in remote school, then in person, then remote, then in person, and the whole routine grew exasperating to the point that lifting out of bed felt like an Olympic vault. I get a little embarrassed saying this because others have lost so much. I know I'm profoundly lucky in every way. I think it's okay to talk about this. We should feel comfortable acknowledging vulnerability, conceding our doubts. Admitting struggle doesn't make you a whiner. It's quite the opposite. It's a ferocious display of strength. I'm hopeful that a year sequestered will turn us into more empathetic listeners, overpowering the judgment economy, which is still in full cruel bore. How hard is it to listen? It's a small thing, but some of the reaction to Meghan Markle's interview the other day came off as callously presumptive. A crackle of critics scrambling to poo-poo as privilege the opinion of someone telling the public she's in pain. Nobody has to obsess about the royals, of course, but I think we can do better. A little humility is advisable because a little humility is always advisable. This crisis is still throwing punches after the bell, and we aren't going to simply leap off the canvas. The news is full of hopeful predictions about recovery, when we're going to feel better about getting out in the world, going on an airplane, heading back to the office, resuming the old, hectic patterns we would taken for granted. I would be thrilled to get there. Sign me up for all of it. Nothing would make me happier than being safely stuffed on a plane full of sunburned people coming back from somewhere fun, even if it lands at LaGuardia. Still, it's not going to be instant. It's not going to feel like flipping a switch. Hidden traumas abound. I presume we're all a little different now. How can we not be? This past year has challenged everyone in unforeseen ways, and a lot of us are just coming to terms with it. There are probably changes still imperceptible. Hopefully, some of the change is for good. How lovely would it be if we all got a little more forgiving of each other and of ourselves, too? How beautiful would it be if we all became better neighbors? Patience remains important. So does grace. The road may be opening up but the road remains long. Okay, so once again, uh, an article about the As a window opens, optimism a about the road ahead, and right? Grace. Window opens, a plea for patience and uh, grace, right? In terms of A sobering anniversary right, coincides with guarded optimism about the road ahead. Okay, so the final passage that we'll take a look at would be silence emerges as a way to boost health, right? And so we'll take a look at this final passage, right? Uh, for this particular video, right? That we'll take a look at. Silence emerges as a way to boost health. Scientists, meditation advocates, and product makers are discovering the physical and emotional benefits of turning down the noise. 
Writing in the mid-19th century, Charles Dickens described the soundscape of London as a distant ringing hum, as if the city were a vast glass vibrating. This vibration has come to define modern-day metropolises from the racket of jackhammers to the ping of phone notifications. But silence is mounting a comeback as scientists, meditation advocates, and even car makers begin to see it as a way to promote physical and mental health. Urbanization and an ever-encroaching digital life have spurred a need for sound-free respites, says Beth McGordy, research director at the Global Wellness Institute, a Miami-based nonprofit. It has grown more acute since the coronavirus pandemic left millions of people juggling their private and professional lives in confined, noisy spaces, she says. People are desperate for silence, she says. Long-term exposure to aircraft and road traffic noise increases the risk of developing hypertension and cardiovascular disease, according to a 2008 study of 4,861 persons who had lived for at least five years near any of six major European airports published in the Environmental Health Perspectives Journal. In France, the nonprofit Bruit Parif estimated in a 2019 report that the clangor of roads, trains, and planes reduced the lifespan of some residents of the Paris region by three years. Studies suggest that periods of silence could encourage the development of brain cells and that two-minute pauses in passages of music could decrease blood pressure and induce a relaxed state. Measuring the long-term effects of silence on health remains challenging because many factors are at play, including how much silence one is exposed to, at what age, and under what circumstances, says Robert Zatori, a cognitive neuroscientist at the Montreal Neurological Institute of McGill University. It's not exactly that silence itself is beneficial. Rather, it's the fact that noise is bad for you, he says. Already, noise canceling is showing up as a feature in consumer goods and experiences. Range hoods pack electronic chips that suppress the growl of fan motors. Cars come with thicker windows, smoother tires, and audio systems that damp sound levels in the cabin. In Austria, guests of Thermé Law's spa are asked not to make a sound as they dip their toes in the saltwater pool. People are desperate for silence. Beth McGrordy, Research Director at the Global Wellness Institute. As noise awareness grows, more public venues and workplaces could develop soundproof, electronics-free spaces for people to unwind in a silent setting, says Joe Loizzo, an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry in integrative medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College and founder of New York-based nonprofit Nalanda Institute for Contemplative Science. These spaces could be lighted with natural light, painted with soothing colors, and furnished with yoga mats and flexible cushions, he says. Relax, an app launched last year, offers guided meditation sessions centered on the concept of intermittent silence, 10-minute silent breaks that users incorporate into their routines. 86 billion neurons in your brain will thank you for giving them some rest, says Krishna Bhatta, a main urologist who created the app. Intermittent silence has the added benefit of making meditation less intimidating to non-practitioners, he says. Future advances in acoustic science could go a long way toward creating more nurturing environments, says Ms. McGrordy. Engineers at the University of Boston have designed and 3D printed a plastic material that blocks up to 94% of sound frequencies when placed in front of a noise source, according to a 2019 study published in the physical review, B Journal. In the coming years, this technology could be used to create walls that absorb human voices or the hum of an air conditioning system, says Reza Ghaffarivar Devak, the study's lead author and a research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. One day, flicking a switch might be enough to go noise-free. Researchers in Singapore have developed a system that cancels out at least 10 decibels of the urban noise that invades apartments. The apparatus consists of 24 speakers that emit sound waves to counter some of the incoming noise, according to a study published in the journal Nature last year.
similar systems could soon be integrated into train seats, office furniture, and even our clothes to create silent bubbles, says Yoel Nayar, chief executive of Silentium, an Israeli company that sells acoustic control systems used in cars made by Jaguar Land Rover Automotive PLC. Sophisticated algorithms will still allow us to hear sudden noises like emergency vehicle sirens, Mr. Nayor says. I believe noise canceling technology will lead to being much more aware of noise, he says. Okay. Silence emerges as a way to boost health. Scientists, meditation advocates, and product makers are discovering. Okay, uh, so that would have been the final passage uh, that we would have taken a look at. And so we'll take a look at uh, more uh, sort of passages, uh, other passages, right, that we'll be taking a look at uh, in order to take a look at uh, sort of more uh, uh, articles, right, passages on different topics that we'll be taking a look at uh, in the uh, coming, uh, in the uh, coming videos to come.